Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome to a law chat about the God Emperor. Not a proper law video, mind you, and in fact the reason why I'm doing this is the same reason why I haven't made a video on the God Emperor. Because obviously I should have, he is one of the most pivotal and important characters in the entirety of 40k. Not to mention he's the guy everyone knows of, and it would probably get a fair few views. From both a lore standpoint and a uh, algorithmic standpoint, you definitely want to be making a video on the God Emperor, yet I never have because I've never felt like there's a good time to do it. I figured I would do one once I'd finished reading the Horus Heresy, and it would be a big one. I still have an enormous notepad document containing god only knows how many thousands of little lines of notes concerning the god emperor, as well as the various assets I would want to have made for it, but well, due to modern day GW circumstances that is not going to be happening anytime soon. But Beyond that, it is how the God Emperor has changed over the course of the Horus Heresy. You may also have noticed that the Horus Heresy Law Breakdown series has been halted for the time being. I do believe I'll get back to it eventually, but frankly, I've grown rather sick of the Horus Heresy. Having read through to its completion now, I feel as if a lot of the later books do a great deal of harm to the overall history of the Horus Heresy and to 40k as a whole. And no character has been done quite as large a disservice as the God Emperor. Let me put it like this, quick and easy before we go into any real detail about it. Before the Horus Heresy, the God Emperor was the unquestioned absolute ruler of humanity, a golden entity cloaked in mystery and myth. He was the warlord who unified ancient terror, bringing all the disparate elements of humanity together and leading them out into the stars in a great crusade where he crushed every opposition creating a galaxy-spanning imperium alongside the Primarchs, demigod generals that he created himself in his mysterious laboratories deep beneath the Himalayas. He was the father of the Legiones Astartes, the most powerful fighting force the galaxy had ever seen, and the creator of the Golden Throne a psychic artifact of such titanic power that it allowed even his mortally wounded form to continue to guide humanity and enlighten their darkness for 10,000 years after his wounding at the hands of the traitor warmaster Horus Lupercal. His incredible achievements, his heroic end, and his continued sacrifice in the name of humanity all made him perfectly fit to be called the God Emperor. Even overshadowing the person that GW um, <laughs> borrowed that title from. And today, he is the biggest part of 40k. Everyone knows who the God Emperor is. Even the word, the title God Emperor, used by so many kings in ancient time, that meaning is almost completely eradicated now in favor of the Emperor of 40k. He was a singular being of incredible achievement, potential, and so much lore gravitas, so much weight, so much substance, not just in 40k or 30k, but in science fiction history in total. Yet, let's have a look at those things, shall we? Now that we've got the Horus Heresy, did he unify Terra? Well, actually no. Uh, there are several independent conclaves still on Terra that the Emperor simply entered into treaties and deals with, like High Brazil for example, because apparently he either didn't want to or couldn't defeat them. 
And it's not even like humanity unified beneath him out of love and respect either, as we have stories of rebellions, and he is often painted as an outright tyrant, in fact. Neither did he launch the crusade by himself, he needed to enter into treaties and alliances with the Adeptus Mechanicus of Mars, handing over to them several full navigator houses so that they could also engage in their own exploration and expansion. But hey, you know, those are the early days, and conquest via diplomacy is just as valid, right? What about the Primarchs then? His demigod sons. He created those. Well, actually, um, he had a whole team that helped him do all of this, and he couldn't make them himself either. He had to enter into a treatise with a chaos god. Oh, and uh, he didn't even do it himself either when it came to creating them from his own gene seed, you see, because he actually needed his wife to help him do this. Uh, so, um, I, I guess you could say that he had a hand in making them at least, but the Legiones Astartes, there you go. There's one of the Emperor's achievements, right? Well, actually, they were created in large part by a woman by the name of Amar Astarte, who was so crucial in their creation that they literally named them after her. <sighs> okay then, but the Golden Throne, that was the Emperor at least, right? Well, he kind of just found that one, and, you know, it's it was a mysterious artifact buried beneath Terra because, you know... <laughs> but, but hey, at least he's a unique individual, right? He is the only god emperor. He is the divine form of humanity. Wait, what's that? He's just a perpetual? Oh, and there's dozens of other perpetuals? Oh, and, oh. And all of the other perpetuals don't like him because they think he's too much of a radical tyrant. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, right. I see. So... He's a good psyker, I guess? <laughs> And that's what the Emperor has been reduced to now. A powerful psyker. <laughs> oh, and a tyrant, I guess. Let's not forget that. We started the Horus Heresy with a god emperor that did incredible things. We ended the Horus Heresy with a dude named Neoth, who was engaged in a domestic dispute with his wife over how he chose to raise their children. This is not an evolution I am enormously fond of. <laughs> See, when you put it like that... <sighs> Alright, let me just, uh, let's, let's back up a second here, okay? Because not all of these things are necessarily immediately negative. I still do maintain that overall, the Horus Heresy was a net gain for 40k and the world building of the uh, of the universe. The first three books, for example, that went into depth about Horus Lupercal's fall are absolutely fantastic, and there are some real genuine jewels in the Horus Heresy. Take A Thousand Suns, for example. It created a very credible fall for Magnus, where at the same time, it feels like he had all the agency imaginable to get out of it, and yet also felt like he was tied hand and feet by the demonic bargain. An excellent example of how to do chaos intervention well. You've also got some bad books occasionally, though relatively few, and some just simply inconsequential books that never needed to exist in the first place, and who could have been used far better on the more ignored legions. And then you've got the books like The Master of Mankind, which is, to me, just a series of confusing choices and decisions, starting, and it can all be traced back to, the choice of having Aaron Dembski Bowden write it. ADB hates loyalists and refuses to write them with even a grain of decency or competence. 
In Adia B's hands, the Custodes, one of the most, one of the most elite and expert organizations in the galaxy in terms of both combat and spycraft, are reduced to a bunch of blithering morons with zero teamwork who cannot distinguish a fake beacon made by a dead demon woman implemented in the hull of their ship for authentic communications from Terra. Throughout the entirety of the first heretics, the custodies are... <laughs> <laughs> They're more comedic relief than anything. Their only significant contribution to the story is to kill an unarmed woman. <laughs> <It's>... <sighs> Assigning anything that has to do with the loyalists to ADB is a invading Russia in the middle of winter level baffling decision, and yet they decided to trust him with the God Emperor. And the issue here is too that not only, actually, you know what, before we get into the God Emperor's character and how it has changed and then changed again and then changed a third time again into a confused jumbled mess that is impossible to construct a good narrative and a sensible personality out of anymore, let's go back to all of the things that the Emperor has no longer done, shall we? Because they're not all bad. A good flaw can make a good hero great. All heroes need adversity. All heroes need flaws because these are the things that make them human, make them relatable, and make them interesting. The flawless hero is usually not the most interesting. Let's begin with the Golden Throne. Okay, having it be a piece of nonsensical archaeotech buried on Earth, right? Bit out of left field and seemingly unnecessary since the real key here, the real big part of the technology, is the Webway Gate. The Golden Throne is intended as a control device of this Webway technology to create an Imperial Webway. It would have made much more sense to have the Webway buried on Terra, since Earth is of course an old planet. The Old Ones have been there, the Eldar have been there, they've checked us out previously. Rather than have the Golden Throne be an operating mechanism, supposedly left behind there by someone, somehow, somewhere, made out of a material nobody understands? What? Did the Old Ones need a chair? <laughs> did they put it there? Was the Eldar? Why did they never use any similar control devices? It's just reductivist. It takes something the Emperor had done and reduces it to something the Emperor didn't do for no particular gain, reason, or rationale. And hell, even after finding it, the Emperor had to put in place an enormous amount of labor and research to get it to work the way he wanted to. Wouldn't it have made more sense for it just to be an invention made by one of the greatest minds in human history that have been alive for the entirety of human history? But apparently, no, it was, it was just a thing. And it was just a thing is a bit of a running theme in all of this. Let's talk about the Astartes, which were apparently created by Amar Astarte, who was the most brilliant biotechnician next to the Emperor, except uh, she was apparently so crucial they named the entire goddamn program after her, even when it was taken over by somebody who hated her. And this achieves nothing. It adds nothing. It expands upon nothing. It attributes nothing to anything. This is a character who has one mention in that plot hole backwards ass book that was Belisarius Call, introducing half a dozen such character, and achieves nothing except taking an achievement away from the God Emperor, lessening him in return. And this is a repeating point, which. Of course, we cannot avoid talking about Erda. God help me, Erda. A character that again exists for no reason whatsoever but to introduce pointless conflict, confusion, and diminishing the Emperor. 
Now, we've already had the whole Chaos Pact thing, and that made a great deal of sense. Okay, so the Primarchs are clearly not entirely natural. They are highly biologically engineered, and that in and of itself was a good enough explanation to me. The Emperor has been alive for literally eternity, he is ridiculously intelligent, and he has access to all of humanity's knowledge. Being able to make a demigod general is something I could definitely see him doing. But adding in the Chaos Pact blows the lines between technology and magic. I quite like that. It implies that the Primarchs themselves were not entirely natural, and we have no idea precisely what the bargain is. This adds in yet another interesting mystery that adds up a great deal of well, speculation and mystery to the Emperor. It is something that adds to his character. He was willing to deal with his great enemy, betray them, and that was probably the plan from the very get-go, to achieve his ambitions. This makes the Emperor seem smart, silver-tongued, and a little bit bald as well. He was willing to venture into the lion's den to get the last piece of the puzzle. Then Erda shows up and, oh yeah, no, that whole Chaos Pact thing, oh, that was just one of the ingredients. Another one you see was apparently Hohaman, because you needed her perpetual genes as well, in addition to the Empress' perpetual genes, to do... God only knows, it's simply stated that this was totally necessary now, you see, and it would make everything so much better. Why? What does this add to the story? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. It introduces yet another throwaway character that just appears out of nowhere. No build-up, no backstory, no history, no existence within the universe and go, Ah, oh, actually, I did that. That's, that's, that's mine now. Please pan it over here. And furthermore, it ruins one of the coolest little mysteries in 40k. One of the best parts of um, the first Heretic, one of the few good parts, was the interesting question that was opened up, like, what actually happened in the Emperor's laboratory? Are the Chaos Gods lying? Probably. Or could it be that they use the word bearers as tools to change the past through some kind of magical mumbo-jumbo? It was an interesting question, and one that could never truly be answered. The best mysteries should always be mysteries, as once explained, like in this case, they tend to be disappointing, as the reason why the the Primarchs were scattered throughout the galaxy was because a woman had a hissy fit. <laughs> I cannot imagine a more reductivist solution to a mystery. <laughs> like it's it's <laughs> it's a parody, isn't it? It is literally a monthly Python sketch. Oh, what caused this? Was it grand intergalactical demons? Monsters beyond our understanding? Or a woman who had a bad day? <sighs> mm. <laughs> it's just... And hey, to begin with, too, there, there was a little bit of a moment there where you could introduce a little bit of a, a character to Elder, right? Because... Initially, she was completely convinced that, oh no, 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 I, I didn't cause them to fall to chaos, silly willy billy, no, 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 I just scattered them through the galaxy and stranded them on a hellhole planet, like Petrabo's world, for example. Or Corvus, who literally had to grow up in a goddamn prison, but no, 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 I have, I have absolutely no fault in why some of them had, you know, less than decent uh, upbringings. Yeah, I... <laughs> Fucking Angron, goddammit. But in another novel again, I think it was um, Warhawks, I believe, when Erebus just turns into an actual... Oh, goddammit, Erebus. Erebus is just... Actually, we're not going to talk about the walking plot point today. That that might be something for another day. But anyways, he just shows up out of nowhere because he knows where Erda is too despite she being super secretive and even the Emperor being one of the few people who actually know where she is, but minor goddamn details. The plot demands a confrontation here. And he, <laughs> Erebus of all people, has to lay it out for Erda. No, no, honey, honey. Here, look, Angron, you sent him to a world where he was captured as an infant and had torture devices hammered into his skull. That was you. 
<laughs> At which point she suddenly goes like, ah, oh, shit, damn it, you're right. Not to mention, I've known about Chaos forever. I've literally been one of the Emperor's closest compatriots forever. And so I decided to throw the Primarchs into Chaos. <laughs> you know what? Thinking back on it, that was a really dumb decision. Why did I do that? And the entire thing is written as if this was is a complete eureka moment for her. It's like, oh shit, I never thought about it that way. <sighs> Half assed goddamn character. After which she is killed off screen, which means she's not dead. I mean, uh, she's a perpetual as well. I, I can they even die beyond fulgurite? I guess. But yeah, no, she's not dead, which leaves us with yet another problem, namely if the goddamn woman is going to return at some fucking point. But to return to the primary point again, Erida's introduction into the Horus Heresy adds nothing except spoiling a mystery, ruining it beyond imagining, and making a woman the cause of the entire galaxy's misery. Which... I mean, on the one hand, I guess I appreciate. <laughs> but it adds nothing. It doesn't build anything up. It doesn't add depth or complexity to anything, if anything. It simply removes it from something much greater than Erida. And it also adds in even yet more confusion, like why the Emperor didn't track her down and strangle her afterwards. And the problem there is too. Now, let's get into the question of the Emperor's personality, shall we? Because, by Jesus, foot fetishists. This is one of the biggest issues with the entirety of the Horus Heresy. The ridiculous inconsistency of the characters. Too many goddamn overpaid authors in the kitchen allowed to make up seemingly whatever they want. And I'm not even blaming the authors necessarily here. I am blaming GW most of all because it becomes very clear that they haven't actually set out a plan here for the Horus Heresy. What they should have done long before they even began getting writers to do anything is lay out precisely the character's backstory, their goals, their ambitions, their reasons for turnings, and their personalities. And this should have become the bible for the authors. Petarabo starts out as a very inquisitive, very interested in things, a bit of a builder, a bit of a philosopher, but then gets grinded down over the years of siege warfare and pointless battle battles to the point where he finally breaks and turns on the Emperor. That should have been Petrabo's story. Instead, he starts out as that peaceful philosopher for about oh, five seconds before turning into a massive raging douchehole who does nothing but shit on people until he meets the Emperor and then he's blinded by the light for another five minutes before doing the exact same thing. Petarabo's entire character can best be summed up as petulant asshole. Except for when, all of a sudden, when it suits the plot, he goes, Oh, I wanted to be a builder. Woe unto me. <laughs> what? It's almost as bad as Logar. Oh, I just want what's best for humanity, you see. Humanity can't be whole without religion. What's that? Worldwide slaughter slash torture porn temples? <laughs> well, if this isn't in the best interest of humanity, I simply don't know what is. God damn, I hate the first heretic. I really, really genuinely do, but... We're wandering a bit off point here again. The thing with the Emperor is, he is... God, I, th I think he's got four or five different personalities at this point. I thought Petarabo was bad with his three odd, but the Emperor goes from... Let's point it down to the most obvious ones, right? On the one hand, the Emperor very clearly cares for the Primarchs. He very clearly cares for his Imperium on a you know, good old-fashioned emotional lovey-dovey level. 
despite Lorgar going against his teachings and his straight up legislation again and again and again and again, blatantly so for years, endangering the Emperor's plan every step of the way, mind you, by spreading religion in the galaxy the Emperor specifically wanted to refuse religion in, what did the Emperor do? Did he gently nuzzle a bolt gun up to the nap of Lorgar's neck and pull the trigger? No. After having yelled at him, God only knows how many times, and God only knows how many official communiques, he took him aside, showed him the poop on the floor, and then rubbed his nose in it, using Gilliman to do it to really hammer home the fucking point. Was it a bit of a brutal demonstration? Absolutely. But I remind you again, Lorga had been told and told, and told, and told. At some point, you gotta get the bat to get the point across, and that is what the Emperor did. On the other hand, then you've got Angron, and the completely baffling actions the Emperor took there, where instead of simply obliterating the army of techno-savages on the surface with a single land strike, saving Angron and gaining his eternal gratitude, he goes down, talks to Angron, hears about his situation, and then kidnaps him on the day of the battle, guaranteeing all of his friends to be slaughtered. <sighs> Stupidity is not a character trait. And this is much more than stupidity, and even then, if the Emperor truly was the pragmatist, because here's the thing, there's this war about the Emperor's character, some claiming that he's simply a tyrant, who doesn't care about anything, who's completely cold and completely pragmatic. If he was, the only thing he could have done with Angron was put him inside of an airlock and flush it. The Warhounds would have remained just as effective without him. They still performed well as a legion. The Emperor could simply have shrugged and go, I don't know, I guess he disappeared. Weird. You're going to have to go look for him. And even if he gets caught in this uh, little old white lie, right, well, now there's three legions missing. Any further questions, anyone? No? No? Alrighty then. In fact, he should probably have done this with a good number of his sons. Conrad Kurz, for example, and there's another character who has his entire body. I'm not going to get into Conrad Kurz's psychology, which took a complete 360 in his Primark book here, because I might throw a gasket. But this is a very clear contradiction again. The Emperor is the absolute pragmatist, yet he refuses to take the pragmatical choice. Hell, the pragmatical choice would be to expend one round of orbital bombardment ammunition and gain Angron's eternal loyalty. Instead, you piss him off as much as you possibly can and make sure that his homeworld is now the least loyal homeworld you'll ever goddamn see. There was an interesting way, um, attempt, more correctly, to try and explain this away by saying that the Emperor doesn't care about individuals, not even the Primarchs, he cares about humanity as a whole, and therefore he's incapable of really being emotionally attached to anyone else. He simply acts again like a pragmatist. Now that's interesting, and I can absolutely see that being the case. In fact, that would be something that would add to his character, because he is, God only knows how old. He has seen God only knows how many millions of close friends die before him. After all of that time, you will undoubtedly have built up walls so high and mentally tough as to virtually be unable to engage with another human being, because to you, they're not even a pet, they're not even a cat you'll have around for 10 or so years, they're a fly in your house. It lasts you two or three days if you're really lucky, and it might only provide you with, well, annoyance whilst it's there. The vast majority of them do. Of course you're not going to be building any real mental or, you know, emotional bonds with these day flies. That makes sense. But again, you then see him also playing favorites. Gilliman is allowed to build an entire goddamn Empire, and Malkador makes it clear that he and the Emperor both expected Gilliman to protect his empire 
thirst, to empire build, to protect it, and to even be ready to secede it from the Imperium if the need was required. Similarly, he also spent a bunch of time with Horus, and clearly liked him personally to the point where he appointed him War Master. Even though, in my opinion again, Sanguinius would have been the goddamn better choice, but hey, the Blood Angel fanboy in me says that if nothing else. He has bonds. He, the way he treats Malkador, for example, is as a friend. Now, Malkador is a bit of a different character again there, but the idea that the Emperor just sweepingly is completely incapable of forming bonds goes against his actions. This is the problem where you return to the whole too many goddamn cooks in the bloody kitchen thing again, where you don't have a solidified character of who the Emperor is, how he behaves, and how he thinks. It leads you to having too many confusing views of the Emperor. For example, the constant question of why he didn't explain things also not being explained properly. And this is one of those plot holes. Instead of simply being a mystery, you are left confused with what's going on. He chooses to tell Magnus more of the secrets of the galaxy than anyone else. Magnus knows what chaos is, at least to a degree, though not all of it. Okay, if you're gonna tell Magnus A, why the hell didn't you tell him B? Or at the very least, why didn't you tell him, hey Magnus, I'm building a magical seat for you back on Terra here. It's gonna be really, really difficult, but you know, we both like that psychic mumbo jumbo, so how about you just goddamn control yourself for just a couple of years, and I'll let you run rampant, my boy, okay? No. And there's another thing as well, God damn it. So apparently, the Emperor felt personally betrayed by Magnus because Magnus had taken his powers too far, he'd run out of control, and he disobeyed the Emperor's edict. Alright, well if the Emperor is capable of being personally betrayed and feeling disappointed, again, he has a god emotional connection. And all of this makes it damn near impossible to make a good portrait of the Emperor. I've been thinking about this for literally like years now, how one would do a lore video on the Emperor, because originally the answer seemed to be obvious, right? You'd wait for the entirety of the Horus Heresy to come out, you'd take studious notes whilst you're doing it, then you'd go over the note as reasonably soon after going through the Horus Heresy as possible, and then you'd construct an idea of his personality, his opinions, and then you'd roll in the lore, what you knew, what you theorized, etc, etc. Absolutely. I did this with Conrad Kurz, for example, because he had a very interesting psyche where it was made clear that he didn't enjoy doing what he did. To him, it was a tool, and it was also an effect of his, uh, his dark passenger, his crazy side. He had split personality. And then that entire thing was blown up by the fact that a random other book, the Primark book itself, worst of all, comes in and says, oh no no, he, uh, he actually gets a secret sifty from all of this, and he just makes up excuses to kill people. Alright, well this goes against his entire fucking story then. Why did he stop killing people? When Nostramo became the perfect society, which he did manage to do, why did he stop killing people? If all he wanted was just to kill people for his own amusement, pleasure and satisfaction, why the hell did he stop? What made him stop? If you could come up with any excuse, why doesn't he? Hell, he could make being afraid of him basically criminal. All he'd have to do then is show up in somebody's living room and go, Heh, I smell fear on you. That's... that's too bad. Huck with the torture kid again. But he didn't. And again, I blame the authors as much as I do Games Workshop for these things, because too many of them had either their own established headcanon of what was going on and didn't get any pushback from GW, or had simply not read all of the previous books, which to be fair, there's a lot of them. Like, yeah. It's difficult to expect an author to read up on 30 other people's work before you get started on your own entry. You would expect there to be a Cliff Notes version available, a law bible of sorts, with rules and well, regulations essentially, on what you can do and what you should do, and how characters should act. And the worst part is, this does seem to appear for some 
else to appear to exist, I mean, from some other characters. Look at Nathaniel Garrow, for example. He remains mostly consistent. Now, even Abaddon does, even though his personality goes from, well, pretty cool guy to psycho crazy person. <laughs> over the course of um, about half a dozen pages, but, well, that's kind of the problem with Horus Lupercal as well, and, well, it's a pacing problem, but after having spent three books on Horus, you kinda just gotta get the move on at some point. But it leaves us with the question, why? Why have all of these changes been added in? And I specifically mention added in as well, since these are things that have been thrown into the mix during the Horus Heresy. Why did we need Erda? Why did we need Amar Astati? Why did we need the Golden Throne to be a thing just found? Why did we need to learn that the Emperor was named Goddamn Neoth? Now, don't get me wrong, to a certain extent I can accept that he used to have different names, because again, he's been around for a while, but Neoth? Not, I don't know, Aquilon, or Caesar, or Attila. Something like that. Something with a bit of gravitas, a Cato. No, Neoth. Oh yes, the, the barbarian king Neoth. Neoth. God damn it. I will never get over Neoth. I, I, I simply will not. And the answer seems to be to reduce the Emperor, which is very interesting because I believe a GW might be trying to course correct on this. Which brings into question who exactly made these decisions, because all of these just takes things away from the Emperor. They add in confusion, they denigrate his character, they remove a lot of his personality, they make what personality remains very foggy and obtuse and difficult to siphon. What's going on, why, how, and why the decisions are being made in the way they are. It leaves too many questions, like, is the Emperor just simply an idiot? Is he a loving father? Does, doesn't he care? Is he a tyrant? Is he simply a pragmatist? And many of these things run in direct opposition to one another, where the Emperor seems to be making a completely different decision in the same bloody instant on different occasions. It's very, 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 very silly. And yet, of course, in the more modern style 40k, they're constantly teasing the idea of having him return as a proper straight-up god, basically. Like that... I, I didn't like God Blight, where they just appear in Nurgle's garden and the Emperor's like, Burn, bitch! Maybe... My theory might be that they are trying to set him up as the Chaos God of Order? essentially, with all the negativity that that implies, because any chaos entity is always going to be seeking an extreme. It is going to be moving towards what gives it the most power, kind of like how Conrad Kurz decided that, okay, well, law and order is good, and therefore I am going to impose absolute law and order on absolutely everyone. That is what the Chaos God of Order would be, the Chaos God of Law. Incidentally, there used to be Chaos Gods of Law and Order and such on stuff, but now we're talking Warhammer rather than 40k, so... Eh. Anyways, they could be doing that, and then they'd have him set up as more almost of a villain-style character. I... <sighs> See, part of me sees this coming because of many of the other more politically oriented decisions that Games Workshop has made over the years, aligning uh, themselves more and more towards a group of people who, well, straight up tend to identify with the villains in a lot of settings. And tearing the God Emperor down, disassembling him, taking away his achievements one by one, and attributing them to completely unknown rando-ass characters that come out of nowhere and serve no other purpose but to be a destructive element, well, that certainly does fit in with a lot of the things we are seeing in many, 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 many other franchises. 
Temptation to roll the whole little Luke throwing lightsaber thing over the room. Never mind, you know, I wouldn't want to get copyright struck or anything like that. That would probably my, be almost my only theory at this point. Which is not a good theory, because it's not the God Emperor I like, or the God Emperor I grew up with, or even the God Emperor that makes any reasonable sense from this point onwards. <laughs> and the whole... Alright, let's also briefly touch upon the idea of the Primarchs being... Uh, being turned back into good guys, being redeemed. I don't think that's a necessarily bad idea for some Primarch. Fulgrim, for example, if they had just ignored that god damn book. If they had just had Fulgrim be stuck in the painting, you could absolutely redeem Fulgrim. And yet they decided not to. Could you redeem Lorga? No. Could you redeem Petirabo? No. Angron? No. Horus? Well, actually... Yeah, kinda. If you made a- if you created one of those perfect clones of Horus, you could, kinda. But any of the other trader Primarchs? A straight up big fat no. Because if you do that now, you're literally pulling the Warcraft. Oh, they're just misunderstood. So what about the billions of people they slaughtered and tortured to death? What about those? Oh, you know, water under the bridge. No. Not in a galaxy like 40k, absolutely not. No matter how powerful or persuasive the Emperor might be at that point. And what does this mean for an Emperor lore video? Oh, that's, uh, that's kind of the conclusion I've been struggling towards over the course of this little uh, ramble of mine here. Right now, I don't feel like there's any way to do him justice, in a way. See, if I was to do an Emperor Law video, I think what I would have to do, I would have to construct it more based upon my own view of the character rather than how he is presented right now. Because he is presented in simply too many goddamn different ways. I suppose you could make an argument that this is an indication of a very mercurial personality, perhaps even some kind of disorder, but there just doesn't seem to be enough of, of an indication of this, enough evidence of this, enough or well, backing up of it. Rather, I think almost I'd be better off making a in the defense of the God Emperor video, going over his decisions and well, deep diving a little bit. Like, for example, one of his more controversial decisions. Oh, oh, he shouldn't have banned religion because, well, you can't ban religion. People will always seek for something greater. It's part of human nature, the Logar argument, basically. I don't buy it for even a single solitary instance, because here's the thing. We know the Chaos Gods like being worshipped. We know it gives them more power. Why? Because the Chaos Gods always seek to do the thing that gives them more power, and everything they do is constructed like a religion, with rituals, with prayers, cladding themselves with the mantles of God, styling themselves the gods, the primary powers, demons, etc. It is all religiously based. And since the demons, the, the great uh, chaos entities, have no other need but to grow, since that is their sole primal instinct, they wouldn't do this if it didn't benefit them. Furthermore, we also know that religion can be used as a scapegoat for chaos. In fact, we know there are literally cults in the modern day Imperium that are chaos cults, but pretend to worship the Emperor in one of his many guises. Oh, you see, we worship the Emperor as, um, you know, the, the kind of corpse god, you know, the, the god of the undead. Yes, because we live on a mortuary world and it totally makes sense. Isn't that right, Papa Nurgle? In such a case, and bearing in mind too, the Emperor knows far more about Chaos than we ever know. If the Emperor believes that the only way to defeat Chaos is to completely eradicate the belief in the supernatural, therefore cutting them off and starving them, odds are he knows what he's talking about. Now there's also the, uh, actually, 
the, this entire argument could probably take me an, an hour in and of itself, and maybe I'll do this at some point. I'm, I'm kind of tempted to. I'm really tempted to, but man, it would probably be a, a pretty major thing. And I also, here's another thing too. I really want to do these topics justice. I want, I want art. <laughs> I want art, goddammit. I want illustrations. I want maybe even some animations. I want to do some stuff with it. I want to give it the Vrax treatment. And yet, with Games Workshop being the way they are, one, not only isn't it safe, but two... <sighs> GW doesn't deserve it. Straight up. They don't. They do not deserve it. And I don't want to spend money on them. <laughs> Simple as. I've got other things to, uh, to use money on, frankly. But... Anywho, I'm going to wrap it up there. Yeah, more of a lore rant today than a lore video, but hey, that's basically what the Horus Heresy uh, lore breakdown series was anyway, so hopefully you'll forgive me uh, this little divergence here. And until next time, when I'll be back with a proper lore video again next week, I hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.